welcome everybody and welcome to our guest, Brian Q. So I am Blair Taylor. I'm the program director for the Institute for Social Ecology, which we're hosting this event. We're a popular education center that kind of focuses on the intersection of social and ecological problems. And our event today is called China and the Western Left. And we are lucky to have Brian Hugh joining us from very early in the morning in <laughs> Taiwan. Yeah, it's our, it's our pleasure. So Brian is one of the founding editors of New Bloom magazine. It's an online journal that covers activism and youth politics in Taiwan and Asia Pacific region more generally. Uh, and it was founded in 2014 in the wake of the Sunflower Movement, which I believe you are, in fact, a veteran of. Is that correct, Brian? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. I was part of the Movement. Excellent, excellent. So I met Brian personally in New York City, I guess, in the early or mid 2000s when you were probably yeah, occupied. Days. I was occup then. I'll see yeah, you. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you were you you did your uh, MA at Columbia at that point in East Asian Studies. I think you were still probably at NYU at that time doing history. Yeah, that's Asian right. That was Studies. my uh, undergrad, and later on I went back for a uh, MA. Okay, okay. So Brian has been the uh, Democracy and Human Rights Service Fellow at the Taiwan Foundation for Democracy from 2017 to 2018. And today he primarily works as a freelance journalist and translator um, and keeping a very busy schedule with New Bloom, which if you guys, I'll share the link here shortly, but it's a really great resource on all things um, Asian politics. And I've learned quite a bit um, reading it. So without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to Brian. And uh, thank you so much for taking your time to be with us today and to everyone else for joining us. Yeah, so it's great to be here today and thanks for everybody for joining. Uh, so a bit about myself, I grew up in New York, I'm from Taiwan, um, went to college in New York, et cetera. And uh, I helped run New Bloom magazine. New Bloom was founded in 2014 after the Sunflower Movement, which involved the month long occupation of the Taiwanese legislature by student activists in protest of a trade deal with China. And so we were founded to try to push for a leftward basis for the movement, uh, to try to think about ways to think about self-determination for Taiwan that do not rely on either the U.S. or China. And so that means critical, being critical of Chinese imperialism, but also U.S. imperialism. And thinking about ways to push for that, uh, self-determination can often be caught in these issues of nationalism, but then how do you think about that from a left basis? Um, and so I think that's where the interest in critiquing uh, what we refer to as tankies comes from. Um, to define tankies briefly, the term used to refer to uh, leftists that idealize the uh, authoritarian kind of countries that are, are nominally socialist. So that would be often Soviet Union uh, or China in these, uh, as, we, as we all speak of them. And so I think what's interesting too is that with the political and economic rise of China, we have this idealization of, uh, of China that is following these familiar lines. Uh, tankyism as a phenomenon is specifically from the Cold War, uh, particularly it's tied to the Anglophone left, UK, US, etc. And there's a long history to this. Uh, but then we're seeing some of these tropes reemerge in a period that some have termed the New Cold War. The New Cold War then refers to the period of rising tensions between the US and China, along lines of a trade war uh, regarding geopolitical tensions in the Asia Pacific, um, and maybe just the concern about a rising power from the dominant power, which is in this case the U.S. But then what one has is uh, this idealization of China as a socialist utopia. Um, one also sees it to some extent with Ukraine, the invasion of Ukraine. Uh, you have nominal leftists that are idealizing Russia as though it were the Soviet Union, never mind that we went through neoliberal shock therapy and uh, the rise of Putin and authoritarianism, and even just you have Putin criticizing the Soviet Union, saying that, well, you know, Soviet Union created Ukraine, we can dismantle Ukraine, this was a mistake, Lenin was wrong. Uh, but then you still have these people kind of idealizing Russia as though the Soviet Union. And I think you see a familiar phenomenon there, but then you also see that with China. And so I think that's what's uh, quite interesting, because there are some ways in which the contemporary phenomenon of tankyism differs from what it was historically you have some of the same organizations are still around because you do have the sectarian left that is existing in the anglophone world these are this is also very specific us uk phenomenon uh, actually there are a few sectarian left groups operating in asia and i'm always struck by that their founder figure is someone who's always someone with a similar background to me that studied or grew abroad in the us etc and trying to bring this organizational form into asia and so i think this is a it's quite specific in that in that sense um however then these organizations are still propagating their ideology which is idealizing China and the Soviet Union and the so-called second world, uh, the socialist world against the first world, the first capitalist world. Um, you have those kind of organizations that still exist and some people get pulled into their orbit. 
But I think what is more interesting then is that you do have younger people that are getting into pulled into the phenomenon. Uh, some of it is internet-based, uh, some particularly when it comes to uh, China are diaspora. And so there are people that are of ethnic uh, Chinese descent in a Western context uh, that idealize what it for them is their cultural motherland, where their parents are from, et cetera. Um, and then you also have this kind of internet driven phenomenon of young kids with flags next to their names on Twitter um, and whatever. And I think this is interesting too, because it reflects the shifts that have occurred in leftist organizing in the past decade. Uh, you have a kind of younger generation that is seeking, particularly I think with regards to anarchism, uh, trying to distinguish themselves from anarchists that are, or leftists or socialists that are more established. And then that entails jumping on board with this idealization of China or the Soviet Union. It's a way to stack out social credibility. Um, it's very Oedipal, trying to overthrow, you know, just what the people came before you were saying. Um, and so that does not necessarily reflect concrete politics, but it does concern me particularly that a younger generation uh, is becoming politicized in this direction. And that was part of my interest in, in critiquing uh, these kind of tankies that, that I think that it's just, I'm concerned about the younger generation of leftists that have been politicized, particularly post-Occupy, in a period in which we've seen the spectacular growth of organizations such as the DSA, uh, that there is so much more organizing along these lines now. Um, I, I, I just find it concerning then that there are people that have these views of China, because I think what this broadly reflects is a uh, failure to understand context outside of the US. And so I think then what's interesting is uh, there are various organizations we can point to, for example, the Tiao Collective, uh, which is mostly diaspora. They have organizational links to the PSL um, and they, they are diaspora. They have an idealized vision of China. Uh, they often are circulating state-run media as their sources. Um, you also have the Tricontinental Institute or People's Forum. Uh, the, uh, these are organizations that also take this line. So for example, that means denialism of what is going on in China. Um, for example, claiming that there are not these concentration camps in which you have up to a million Uyghurs imprisoned. Uh, what's interesting too is that when it comes to these actions of China, then the claim is it's all just US propaganda, the US is making it up, uh, it's all from the CIA. But if you look at Chinese state-run sources, even the ones that are just operating in English, even if you're not able to read Chinese, for example, China is not denying this either, that these camps existed or exist. Um, just that they there's a kind of reversal point in which they denied for a long time they existed and then they're like, well, we can't do this anymore. And so they actually say they exist, but they claim it's for re-education, for uh, training, vocational training. That this is meant to benefit Uyghurs who are a minority, are a Muslim majority, um, and are historically poor compared to their Han counterparts. But then I think what happens then is attempt to just dismiss this I say it's all CIA propaganda that's not real. Um, and, you know, China's not actually claiming they don't exist. Uh, that that is, a, is a paradox. And so when one looks through these claims by some of these tanky groups, they just do not correspond even to what this Chinese state is saying. Uh, you'll have, for example, incidents such as the uh, fighting between Indian military forces and Chinese military forces on the border, uh, border conflicts. And so this is, this is quite familiar. However, uh, then just still be in denial of this, just as though it's not happening or that India and China were actually aligned in their geopolitical uh, kind of affiliations, which is not the case at all. Um, and, and just that's just a very bizarre thing. It just does not correspond to what is going on on the ground. Um, but then I think uh, you have this projection of US, uh, I guess you could say politics or, or framings onto China. Uh, the view of, for example, Chinese people as a minority or being oppressed, that's something you see in the US, uh, particularly with all these uh, the anti-Asian racism that you have seen post-COVID with people of Chinese descent blamed for bringing COVID to the world, uh, your violence against Asians in the streets, uh, that kind of thing. But then when you look at China, the uh, ethnic Han are the majority. And so unsurprisingly, as the majority, you have the oppression of minorities, such as Uyghurs or other quote-unquote ethnic minorities, uh, particularly on the basis of their religion, for example. The fear is that from the Chinese state, that Uyghurs are prone to separatism, that they will push for the independence of Xinjiang because they have a different religion. And that seems to be one of the rationales for imprisoning that many Uyghurs in these camps. Um, what also is of note is that the justification for these camps often draws on US war rhetoric, saying that, well, they're dangerous, we need to have these camps to combat extremism uh, and so forth. When one actually observes the actions that China is carrying out in the world, Often it does seem to be patterned after the US. The US is the dominant power in the world. Uh, when you're a rising imperial power, that is the model that you're imitating. So building parallel structures to the US, uh, for example, One Belt, One Road, or that's framed as though it were an attempt to boost uh, the global south by tankies, but this attempt to expand regional influence. 
uh, the construction of the a Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, uh, having China wanting alternative institutions to, for example, the World Bank or the IMF. Well, this is patterned after that, but then you'll have the claim that this is completely different. And so what then is interesting is that tankies, their idealization of China, uh, often will justify the actions of China that are not so dissimilar from the US. Uh, you have the justification of police violence, for example, in Hong Kong after the 2019 protests. Uh, just the protests were in reaction to an extradition bill which would have allowed for Hong Kongers to be deported from uh, China or to China, uh, potentially facing charges. And so that, that raised a lot of these concerns regarding the use of this for political persecution. And at its peak, it led to 2 million people protesting in the streets of Hong Kong. And, uh, you know, I think by proportion of the population, it's one of the largest mobilizations in modern history. Uh, 2 million of a 7.5 million population. That's around like 25% of the people, uh, something like that. Um, and so this was a massive movement. Uh, there was a lot of police violence. Uh, there was clashes between protesters wearing uh, gas masks, safety helmets with police with batons, uh, water cannons, uh, body armor and, and that sort of thing. And so then you have this occurring at the same time as you see police violence elsewhere in the world regarding uh, backlash against Black Lives Matter, uh, various protests in the US and so forth. But then you'll have the tankies saying that, well, there's not police violence happening in Hong Kong or that these are quote unquote socialist police. And so they are justified in their violence. You're not gonna have this broader claim uh, pushing for let's say the abolition of police as an institution. Um, and that's a paradox. That's a, a paradox I think that the tanky left then actually just idealizes uh, what they were criticized in the US, uh, not pointing to the parallels between the US and China, but just always saying China is something qualitatively quanti uh, just different from the US, even when you just see just policing activity, uh, you see attempts to expand imperial power, uh, you see military threats directed by China at its neighbors. Uh, for example, in Taiwan, you have, have, uh, have warplanes intruding on Taiwan's air defense identification zone, sometimes near da daily, just uh, this is the airspace around Taiwan in which planes identify themselves. And so you have more planes deployed whenever the US and China have uh, meetings, for example, you have planes sent to ramp up tensions, uh, to raise the stakes for negotiations, uh, et cetera. But then, then just the attempt is kind of bury your head in the dirt and claim this does not happen. Um, but then I think uh, what's also interesting too is that you have the intellectual uh, justification for this from Western leftists or theorists, such as let's say David Harvey or Richard Wolff or people like that. There'll be the claim that China is different from the US. Uh, you don't want to criticize China you claim that China has found this sort of secret social sauce to productivity. Uh, I think uh, Harvey, for example, has attractive scrutiny, but, uh, as well as Olf, for pointing to the spectacular economic growth of China and saying that, well, this is something different, that through control of the state, there has been this uh, boosting of the economy in a way that is achieving growth the U.S. cannot. And I just wonder then about self-claimed leftists that are so focused on growth and take these metrics at face value. Because when you look at it, I think in terms of the GDP, uh, China is only now on the verge of surpassing the US. And you just look at the differential in population that the US is what, 350 million people, 330. Uh, China is 1.4 billion people and is so much geographically much larger. If only now China is on the verge of surpassing the US, that is actually, when you flip it on its head, that is a, a tremendously inefficient economy. Um, but then I think that you have this fixation on just uh, I think along the, the similar lines from the, the quote unquote first Cold War of the so-called social state that you idealize as having cracked the secret of productivity in a way that Western capitalism has not. And so then this is just transplanted to China. Um, and it doesn't often, it often does not actually correspond to conditions on the ground as I've kind of alluded to. Uh, you have pointing to that the state owns the land and therefore you cannot have uh, capitalism. Uh, this kind of argument gets brought out variously by experts or, or tankies. Um, and just that's not actually the case. You do actually have government officials selling land and, and that's just not how things are being carried out in China right now. And so I think that points to this issue, which one sees with the tanky left. And I think the tanky left uh, with this online phenomenon with Tiao or groups like that, is starting to affect these theorists that we've known or, or you can see the influence even in, in groups such as the SA. Uh, they refuse to, for example, stand with Hong Kong Union activists coming under fire from the government. Uh, the DSA and trash community is particularly known for, for that, um, just that feeling that you cannot actually protest the Chinese state. Uh, it's a way in which the lived experience of those on the ground in Asia is disregarded. Um, just that there's not the attempt to talk to them or, or hear what they are saying. I think a lot of times any person, I mean, they'll just claim that, well, you know, you will never encounter poverty in China, but you just venture on the streets in China and that is something you see. Um, and I just think that a lot of it actually returns to this kind of uh, Euro-American centrism from the Anglophone left, putting the US empire at the center of everything, saying that this is the only big bad in the world, that there's only one enemy, which is the US. 
And so you cannot criticize China. China is instead held up as an uh, kind of idealized utopia. It's, it's strange because then I think that one can be critical of both sides. Uh, you see the, uh, during the new Cold War, quote unquote, what I think the phenomena you see that you didn't have in the first Cold War as much is this tremendous interdependence of the US and China. Uh, they are reliant on each other as markets. Uh, China is producing a lot of the electronics that the U.S. needs. Um, the, uh, there's always a claim, I think, that, you know, similar to, let's say, Fukuyama's end of history thesis, that U.S. and China would never go into conflict because they were so tightly connected economically at this point. And that has not exactly proven to be the case. Uh, but it, it just points to, I think, the convergence of these global superpowers within the framework of global capitalism. And so oftentimes from the experts, you'll have the framing of China as post-socialist, uh, having gone through a period of shock therapy similar to the USSR, even a former USSR in Russia. Um, but then that's that's not what you have taken up. I think just these kind of familiar notions have just re-emerged. And then I think that particularly uh, with regards to US and China in the quote unquote new Cold War, you have a pattern of tit for tat escalation. This one side does something, the other side does something in response. They both perceive themselves as on the defensive, as not being the aggressor. But when both sides are like that, things start escalating. And then you have leftists that are only pointing to the actions of the US, saying that, well, the US is the one ramping up tensions. We need to say no to the new Cold War uh, and back down. We cannot just, we cannot have these military threats going on from the US, but it also does occur from China. And so then it just becomes a, a form of uh, insularity, just saying the US is the only actor in the world, that China is not in itself an imperial power. And when you look at things from the perspective of those on the periphery of China, that that is not what people feel or experience at all. I mean, just in terms of uh, me being in Taiwan, facing these military threats daily that you see in the news, uh, just China's conflicts with its neighbors of the South China Seas. Uh, part of the tension is about shipping routes in, in the Asia Pacific, which could be cru crucial for trying to develop trade or, or expand power outward um, and so forth. But that, you know, you just don't have this kind of experience coming up. It just framed only in relation to uh, the US and the action of the US in the Asia Pacific as though nothing else actually matters. And so it's, it's, it's fascinating to me that then there's this, this uh, inability to deal with a multipolar world because that is the world that we live in. We do not live in a Manichaean world to begin with. I think as leftists, we need to be critical of global capitalism from whichever state rather than just idealizing states. But you have this uh, defense even of what aboutism, just, well, you know, what about the US doing this there? It's used to just, it's used to take down critiques of China. But as I alluded to with, let's say, the uh, use of war and terror rhetoric to justify imprisonment of Uyghurs, uh, the uh, use of uh, the, the kind of emulation of U.S. Uh, economic institutions, one where they can see very strong parallels between both. Um, and so that, that is quite hard to do. And I think for often the uh, tendency for, for uh, Anglophone leftists is to more to self-flagellate about the West rather than to engage with what is going on in the world and these messy realities. I mean, what are the stances that leftists should take uh, regarding uh, China and the U.S. conflict? Uh, how, do you, how do we think ourselves outside of this? And I think that a lot of men, a lot of times then the lessons have not been learned from the uh, first Cold War. And so then I guess to kind of tie back to this phenomenon of tankies, uh, it reflects this kind of failure of critical reflection on the left to truly be internationalist. <clears throat> I mean, internationalism does not just being pointing out the US's actions the world over. It means really thinking one's way out of a world in which the US is not the only actor. And I think this is also quite interesting with regards to Ukraine, uh, because this idealization of Russia or the, the kind of attempt to criticize only NATO and not Russia, which is literally invading Ukraine, is somewhat along similar lines. And so one has reactions from Ukrainian leftists uh, against this, this uh, just this insularity. And despite the uh, Anglophone left being, I think in many ways internationally quite influential because English is the lingua franca of the world, uh, one has this, this almost provincialism, just this failure to think beyond the American perspective. And then I think what then to think about anti-imperialism, this is theoretically taken root in, in anti-war groups and tankyism can be quite extreme as a phenomenon uh, in terms of just the, the claims about China that are just really not uh, rooted in reality in the slightest. But I think it, it is expanding in terms of influence uh, in organizations such as the uh, DSA or the Progressive International and among the thinkers such as uh, Harvey or Wolf or, or et cetera. And that, that is something that is harder to deal with because this, I think, does have an impact. Um, and so then I think thinking about our, our ways out of this that, that is the question for the left today. Uh, I think the, the left is, is somewhat unprepared to deal with this new Cold War. The invasion of Ukraine took a lot of people by surprise. Uh, history is suddenly now with a capital H back on the stage. But then just months earlier, I was, I was listening to Trapo, Chapo Trap House dismiss Ukraine as just Slavs in tracksuits and, and being very dismissive of, for example, the notion of war breaking out 
in the Asia Pacific. Um, some of this hyperbolic rhetoric gets a little extreme in the sense that we are quite far from that, uh, the quote unquote new Cold War. We're not the perspective of nuclear annihilation uh, just yet. Tensions have not gone to that point. And, and as I mentioned, both countries are economically interdependent, and that is maybe a barrier to getting to that level immediately. However, uh, what one does see is particularly in anti-war groups and spaces, some which do uh, carry on a direct legacy from the new left, is again just this uh, failure to grapple with that the U.S. is not the only one at fault here. And what does it mean then to actually connect with people on the ground that are facing the uh, dual threats, I guess, of U.S. imperialism and also Chinese imperialism? And this has been the, the dynamic that one has seen in Asia really for uh, decades, even uh, hundreds of years, just smaller countries concerned about China that's in pre-modern times. Uh, but then it just somehow the U.S. is seen as the only force in the Asia Pacific that is that matters or needs to be resisted. And any other attempts to think one's way out of that is, is sort of shot down. And so I kind of will leave it there because I, I'm looking for the discussion. I think it's very uh, good to share ideas and, and talk further about this. But uh, yeah, thanks for listening. Great, thanks so much, Brian. Uh, a lot to chew on. Um, so I think we can just open it up to questions um, from participants. So if folks want to get on stack, if you can maybe just either raise your hand or throw an asterisk into the chat here and uh, I'll keep the stack and we'll probably try to group some together and you can pick and choose, Brian. Mm. Yeah, that'd be great. Right. Right, Same as a hand. Yeah, let's see here. Where that... Where's that hand? I see it, but I can't see. Oh, there it is, Lily. Yeah, thank you. Hi, Lily. Um, hi, hi, Blair. Thank you guys both for being here. Yeah, I was um, drawn to this event because I have a really close childhood friend who got very involved in the PSL. Um, mm -hmm. And I really appreciate this, this discussion so far. I feel like it's just spot on. So I have two questions for you. Um, Cause it's been like really bad <laughs> with the PSL. And so like my first question is um, like, how do you talk to someone, you know, like involved in this? Cause I feel like I've tried to apply the double standards. Like I've tried to say things like, I'm not not trying to criticize, you know what I mean? Like the US or just blame like one side, you know, I've tried to center like Uyghur voices and be like, you know, your organization talks about listening to communities and like you're citing Chinese state propaganda. And like, I'm actually, you know what I mean? Like listening to people from there. Like I always try to say, I don't have to criticize China from a Western point of view. Like I can look to the Hong Kong groups or people mm -hmm. there, you know what I mean? Like, I feel like, and it's just this like ideological commitment. So that's the first one is like how you, you know, cause I get really emotional, you know, I'm like, I feel like the Uyghurs, especially it mimics Holocaust denial and stuff. Mm -hmm. and I'm like, you're Jewish, I'm Jewish. You know, it's this like really emotional sort of thing. Um, so that's just one sort of a personal insight that you might have. And then two is like, you know, going to the, some PSL events and, you know, like actively engaging in this, you know, there's really, um, I like, you know, watching my friend sort of gradually become this you know, exact a perfect description of what you're describing. You know, it seems like um, like ideologies of violence had a large role. You know, to the point where like I was told that like it's a mischaracterization to talk about nonviolent practices in the context of MLK Jr. or Gandhi, which like no doubt their views changed. You know, under harsher and harsher repression. And I looked into it, and it's like, of course they drew distinctions between like state violence and standing up for yourself, but like, you know, and, but, you know, I, I'm like, so I'm all for like the left arming itself, you know, like when the right is really heavily armed, like I support the John Brown gun club, but there are like other theories of transformation too. Right. Or like, I don't see like why principles of nonviolence cannot have their use on the left or, you know, I mean, have their own powerful moments. And I'm wondering like, what is your stance? You know, cause the PSL is pretty heavily like, we're only going to have revolution through violence, you know, like we need to arm ourselves and like, um, kind of just like, do you ever navigate, like, cause now you're living in this heavily militarized area, you know, like how do you navigate that kind of thing on the left too? Like, do you see sort of violence as really fundamental to a revolutionary praxis, I guess? <laughs> Those are two very big questions. So. <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah, I think it's a uh, tough. It's uh, very hard to untanky somebody. Um, I just think that people tend to dig down their heels into belief systems when they are challenged, and that is the case with tankies many times. Uh, I think the paradox then is, as I mentioned, just oftentimes the things they are saying is very different from what the Chinese uh, state media is even saying, or what the, the Chinese Communist Party is even saying, even just in English. And and so, as I mentioned, the Chinese government is not exactly denying these camps. So there's a long time of denial. Then they acknowledge the list. And they're just like, well, they're vocational camps. They're not imprisonment camps for, for people because of their religious belief or to whatever stave off separatism. They're vocational camps. Um, and then uh, you just see some of the rhetoric from the Chinese government. Uh, sometimes it is actually quite racist uh, that it can be quite direct. Um, Black Lives Matter is actually an interesting example because, uh, for example, around the Peter Liang case in, in New York City, state-run media was supportive, quote unquote, of Black Lives Matter as a way to criticize the US and racial tensions in the US. And then suddenly we have a Chinese American cop that killed somebody, a uh, black person, then state run media is like, well, it's racism against Chinese people. And just the narrative reverses really quickly. Um, you can even just look at the exact article. I think I've written about this. And the the before making clear what what background the cop was, they were be like, well, this is just the US, uh, whatever. But once it becomes known that it's someone of ethnic Chinese descent, it changes. Um, but then I think people just dig their heels down, uh, centering voices. They're like, well, they're just taking a, a kind of uh, co-opted by the CIA. Uh, and then when you get into that territory, it's very hard to convince somebody because it is in the realm of conspiracy theories. Everything is a CIA conspiracy. America is everywhere in the world. There's no other actor. Uh, any marginalized voices, you can't listen to them because they are also just, at the end of the day, corrupted by American imperialism. And so this kind of moral high ground that you just, they try to pin the, everything, everything is blamed on the US. Um, but then I think that points another interesting characteristic, maybe he's alluding to some of your comments about violence, uh, because then the justification is of Chinese state violence uh, against its own people. Uh, you're not calling for abolishing the police, you're justifying Chinese police. You're not calling for a stance against militarism, you're justifying Chinese militarism. And it almost just seems like have, wanting to have a, a good version of the US, uh, a US that in which you have quote unquote socialist cops or a socialist military, whatever that means exactly, or left military. Um, and I think that just not really does not get beyond liberalism. It's just, it just is this sort of uh, attempt to radicalize or have a kind of radical version of, of U.S. empire. And that, again, reference this, this uh, centrism, this failure to think beyond the U.S. and projection of the U.S. onto other contexts. Uh, and that also includes just thinking of, of the horizons of political possibility. That that's, seems to be your end goal, just have a, a left version of the U.S. of U.S. empire in the world, and then we're all set. And that, that, that's, I think, pointing those contradictions is, is uh, something that's worth doing, but then it's actually very hard to actually convince people. And so my main means of doing that is just fighting with them online. And I'm not sure that's necessarily convincing people, but at uh, least it's getting somewhere maybe. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. So we've got Jennifer Ruth and then Max B up next. So why don't you both ask your questions and we can see if we can find some points of commonality. Okay, great. So uh, I'm Jennifer. Brian, I just want to say I've just started following your work and find it really excellent. And so I work on, I'm a film studies professor. Um, can you hear me okay? I don't yep. see myself on there, so okay. So um, I'm a film studies professor and I work on uh, Sinophone cinema and some East Asian and Hong Kong cinema and Taiwan cinema. And I'm on the left and I find it really hard in the United States to you know, raise awareness around the what happened in Hong Kong and the precarity of Taiwan, precisely because being on the left in Portland, Oregon, the sense I do get a lot of that, like, you know, that the Hong Kong activists are liberal or conservative or, or just just this, just a, to a total misunderstanding of the degree to which Han the CCP is a new is an empire. The sort of Shumei kind of arguments around uh, around th that we've so privileged, ironically, Western imperialism that we don't think about other forms of empire. Just like you're saying, in terms of thinking about the different centers of power, not just the United States. I guess what I, I don't I'm not sure what my question. The thing that I encounter the most, um, being an American in the West Coast, is this the hard conservative. So for example, I um, I wanted to go to Hong Kong to study the status of academic freedom after the passage of the national security law. And I am coming to Taipei this spring, the, in like a month to think about the relationship, with how academics think about academic freedom in relationship to support uh, supporting pluralist democracy. 
Um, but so the what the reaction of the the on the right that the, the fascist left in the United States and the degree to which people in Hong Kong liked Trump. Um, and I guess the, so you'd say like Scylla and Charybdis, you have the people on the left who can't see outside of the anti-American prism and want to privilege anything that seems to carry however speciously the name socialism. And then you have the people on the right who want to talk about the fascist left. And I guess I'm not sure what my question is so much as I'm trying to figure out where the alliances are, where the coalitions. And I just, I did just recently come across the Laosan Collective and the magazine and New Bloom. And I'm just wondering if, I guess I'm not sure what I want to ask you, except that to what degree, wh where the coalitions are for people on the left who are critical of the CCP, who want Taiwan independence and, and pro-democracy, um, who, uh, where, where to go for that? other than New Bloom and Laosan. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, I mean, definitely look me up when you're in Taipei. It's always great connecting. Um, okay, great. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a question. I think uh, there's not a clear route out. And so both New Bloom and Laosan were founded to try to think our ways through this, but we're also still trying to just figure that out ourselves. Uh, I think it is challenging because there is a right and there are people in these pro-democracy movements that are affiliated with the right. Uh, you have a long phenomenon going back decades of, for example, Chinese democracy activists that post Tiananmen end up in the U.S. and then just end up in the hands of the American political right, or just these become strange bedfellows uh, that yes. they embrace this. Um, and that's been a phenomenon for decades. And you have someone like Chen Guangchen, the blind lawyer, that's another recent example, and he's descended into this MAGA, Trump conspiracy theory, uh, etc. You have even people, someone like Ai Weiwei, the, the artist, uh, which, you know, I was point out that he designed the bird's nest in the Olympics in 2008. So he's actually pretty tied to the state back then, but he's seen as a democracy dissident now. And he also sometimes will be circulating these kind of conspiracy theories on, on, from the American right on, on Twitter and, and so forth. And that's, that's an issue. Uh, and then you have American flags in the Hong Kong protest that gets held up uh, during the protest because people are appealing to America. There's a belief, I think, globally, uh, which also you do see propagated through media sometimes, you know, Hollywood films and, and that sort of thing, that the U.S. is a force for good in the world that it can come and save everybody. And so you have this appeal to the US to, to take action. Uh, so holding up the Hong Kong flags, uh, sorry, sorry, American flags in the Hong Kong protests is a way to try to, well, you know, get the US to do stuff, uh, to take sanctions against uh, Hong Kong government officials or Chinese, I guess we say oligarchs uh, and, and that kind of thing. You see this in a protest film like uh, Revolution of Our Times, which is a Hong Kong documentary film that is now, I guess, more widely available worldwide and the target audience does actually seem to be America. That, that is actually, and you have all this uh, American flags appearing ends on the note of American Congress uh, congressmen reacting to Hong Kong and passing legislation. And it's problematic. I think that, you know, people have jumped into thinking this, idealizing the US, um, but then the tanky left will be like, well, you know, it's all CIA, just uh, they're all in the background. All the Hong Kong protesters are paid off uh, or, or what have you, or magnifying the presence of these groups in order to, to tar the movement and discredit the movement writ large. And, and that is also an issue. I mean, for example, Ukraine, you have the magnification of the Azov battalion, just claiming that, well, they're all like this, you know, they're all fascists. And so this is why Russia is justified. Uh, that is, I think, that is another, another issue. I mean, just definitely there are these elements of the right that should be critiqued, uh, first of all. I mean, in terms of, let's say, Hong Kong or Taiwan, sometimes it's around ethno-nationalism in that there is an embrace of nationalism, uh, you know, Hong Kong or Taiwanese nationalism to counter China. And that, that is something that should be criticized because that does lead to the emergence of a domestic right that is problematic. But then there are also quite a lot of people that are just uh, really naive about the U.S.'s world, world in the world and its actions globally. And so I think oftentimes then for the left, it should be a process of education uh, rather than just dismissing all these people as right wing or inherently fascist or, or whatever. I think the, the presence of, of American flags in the Hong Kong protest sometimes gets really magnified because as I was alluding to regarding American centrism, Americans sometimes will just see that and just they'll, they'll inflate the presence of that flag and just, just one person with a flag, not every person with a flag, but you focus in on yourself, it was relevant to you. And so I don't have a good answer there too, but I think those are, are things worth thinking about and dynamics are worth probing. Yeah. Thanks, Brian. So why don't we take Max B's question and Latif McLeod's question, um, and then we can move on. And Brian posted a question. You want to take three? Would that be manageable? Sure. Let's do all three. Yeah, sure. hmm. And I can read Brian's if he's not able to join in because he posted it. So Max? Uh, uh, 
Hello, everyone. I'm uh, I'm with the DSA. Uh, came here mostly out of some of my own concerns about the concerns and critiques about the International Committee's statements on Ukraine and how that might end up affecting future developments in East Asia, Eastern Europe, and other parts of the world where this sort of something similar could ha be happening very soon. Um, the question I had is, uh, I suppose it boils down to how to support uh, struggles against Russian and Chinese imperialism without falling, without necessarily uh, without necessarily uh, calling upon or even supporting NATO, because I know that's something others in my organization have had concerns about. And I don't, and I've had to grapple with those sorts of things as well. The, just the fact that the fact that Russia's invasion of Ukraine has val has only validated NATO's raison d'être. Uh, the fact, the fact that for many, hmm, for many left wing parties and organizations in Eastern Europe, they are very much they very much prefer to work with NATO and work with uh, work towards sanctioning and taking actions with with NATO against Russia, and I wanted to know if there was, if there is any sort of alternative to that, or should we, or is it just, or is our option here just a cautious support, as it were? Thanks, Max. Uh, so Latif and then Brian, and then we'll let Brian <laughs> dive in. Hi, Brian. I want to ask about the Belt and Road Initiative. Is it a benign development project for China, or is it a more of a colonization project towards Africa? Thanks, Latif, and it's nice to see you. It's been a few years. Uh, Brian. Yes, hi, Brian. Thanks for joining us today. Um, I'm sure you're aware of the ongoing debates that have played out on a number of websites around Chinese energy and environmental policies. I'm thinking in particular of some of the polemics between Richard Smith on one hand and John Bellamy Foster and others on the other hand with um, Foster and others mostly echoing the ecological civilization rhetoric emanating from the Chinese state and Smith and others pointing out the continuing legacy of overdevelopment, excessive pollution, uh, increasing coal use in China, and, and many other issues. And I'm just curious what additional insights you might be able to offer us on, on those questions. Okay, sounds great. Uh, so first I'll take the kind of question on NATO. Um, yeah, I think that this question then, calling attention to uh, militarism, it's hard finding a way to be critical of, of both sides in that sense. And, Again, I think that the issue is to avoid uncritical capitalism, just not idealizing NATO because Russia is the aggressor or vice versa, just only talking about NATO and just being like, well, Russia is not doing anything wrong. And so that's the case with China as well. And, and uh, I think that you have a pattern of escalation uh, on both sides, neither side perceives themselves as the aggressor, which is probably the most dangerous thing and the driver of, of this kind of tit for tat escalation. Um, and then I think particularly with the DSA or other groups, just uh, I think the, uh, what is kind of particularly damaging, I think to internationalism is, when, when people do see Western left groups just only focusing on the West and not actually talking about uh, Russia or in this case, China, uh, that is damaging because then that actually feels the right in any of these places. So with regards to what I mentioned in Hong Kong or with like Tony's, the right wing, they'll be like, well, the left in the US is like this, they're not our friends. And so that weakens the domestic left. It becomes harder to build that. It strengthens the right. Uh, I think that's a paradox, but then I think a lot of this kind of politics you think only in terms of the U.S. actions or what affects the U.S. domestic left. And so that just ends up being critiquing the actions of the West and not uh, building ties and or thinking about what the effect on the, the left in other parts of the world would be. 
uh, or that this could potentially benefit the right in those parts of the world, and you, that you're actually strengthening those ties. Um, and I think that's the challenge. I think that that's a question that really needs to be pondered. And then I guess the other two questions sort of dovetail regarding uh, ecological civilization or China's claims to be an ecological civilization and the Belt and Road Initiative and the question of Chinese colonialism, quote unquote. Uh, so I think that is also the challenge because I think you have this idealization of China on environmentalist grounds along these lines of just what was claimed regarding productivity, that they practice secret sauce to, in this case, environmentalism versus productivity and growth. Uh, and just, that's again the claim that China is qualitatively different, that it is uh, doing things that are, are more uh, trying to meet these climate change goals. And what really astonishes me, even from I think otherwise brilliant thinkers uh, such as you know, Foster or whoever, they, they often are taking these Chinese state sources at face value and I'm just like, okay, well, you wouldn't take the US's rhetoric on this in the same way, but you're taking this Chinese state run media or some statement of Xi Jinping that he just randomly threw out there at face value, and that, that is an issue. Uh, when you actually also then think about things in a more totalizing or, or universalist way, I don't know how you phrase this, it just, it just, it's just naturalism, some kind of you know, ecological naturalism. Like what does ecological civilization mean? Uh, if Joe Biden was saying today, ecological civilization, the US is an ecological civilization, that's, that would be some kind of alarmist, uh, nationalist, imperialist, weird claim that is on ecological grounds uh, using this kind of eco-naturalism but then you, when it's coming from China, then apparently this is okay. And so I just generally caution of being, uh, taking anything from the state, the Chinese state, the US state, any state at face value in this way. But I think that is something that we see. Uh, but then regarding Belt and Road Initiative, which is, uh, for those that don't know, one of China's initiatives to expand economic power um, to uh, westward, also in China, uh, sorry, in Africa, um, other parts of the world. There's the kind of critique of that as quote unquote neo-colonialism. Uh, I mean, this is not directly taking place of uh, colonizing a place and direct political control, but through economic means, exerting power. Uh, there's an accusation of debt dollar diplomacy, um, debt diplomacy, just uh, kind of admiring countries with expensive infrastructure projects that then leads them to be beholden to China uh, because of the debt from those projects. Uh, there's actually a, a debate about that. I mean, in the sense that does it actually fit the criteria for uh, colonialism or can this actually be viewed as neo-imperialism? Uh, I think state actors in these places have their own agenda in embracing Chinese development projects. They're not just only passive actors in these cases. And the, uh, it's not as top down, I think, as a lot of people frame it as. There is pushback from local actors. Uh, it's kind of an, it's not just the Chinese state dictating what goes on and, and just that's what happens. Uh, there's a lot of uh, networked behavior there. Uh, but then, then overall, I mean, it's still the Chinese state trying to expand power. I think that uh, there's a debate regarding that from scholars, does it actually fit these criteria? Then you have the tanky version, which is just like, well, you know, China is only trying to benefit the global South, and that's the only thing they're trying to do there. And I think that you know, it's actually just uh, uh, somewhere where the Chinese state is trying to just increase its power, and that also ties back to my general kind of caution of states in general. We should just be cautious of what they're doing. Uh, they're usually not out for the interests of people, and that also includes China. Thanks for that, Brian. Uh, I'm still taking questions if people want to jump on, but I want to slip myself into the stack because so much of what you're saying here also just brings me back to like an earlier point in left politics. Well, one reference is like the new left when this kind of global shift away from class struggle towards like an international struggle, framing the first world versus the developing world is kind of replacing that earlier class struggle. And there's been a lot of, you know, really good criticism. I, I recommend folks um, read Moshe Postone, History and Helplessness. And he basically argues that this was a move done out of political powerlessness, right? Like we don't have any actual agency to create a better world. So the best we can do is kind of be armchair generals for this side or the other side, but it's ultimately a very non-utopian um, kind of powerless one. And the other part that reminds me of is also like more in the 80s and 90s, I guess, when Bookchin was, you know, engaging in a lot of polemics against Marxists. And a lot of what he was saying was exactly that it clung to this kind of producerist mentality, which just, you know, red growth, growth, um, technology, technological development that, you know, once we have that, then we'll have the, the basis for a socialist civilization. And it's kind of surprised me to see people who are like even, you know, um, sympathetic to social ecology, like uh, David Harvey taking up some of these, you know, kind of crude old fashioned producerist ideas and putting them out there. And the last thing I just I, I want to throw out there is 
I waited, I spent part of today wading through the comments section on um, a Jacobin article that a friend of mine wrote that was about, it was basically debunking the claim of, of Putin coming in to denazify the Ukraine. And I was, as I was wading through the 200 comments on there, I was just struck how much it was exactly the same. I do research on the far right. Um, of like reading the comments of the far right's like QAnon conspiracist worldview and how anti-imperialism is such a powerful and flexible, I mean, there obviously there is real imperialism, imperialism in the world, imperial powers, but it can become so elastic that it becomes an explanation for any and everything. And I too was surprised when, you know, people that I otherwise sometimes have political affinity with, like the Chapo Trap House podcasters, they were so dismissive of, um, the early reports about you know Russian troops massing on the Ukrainian borders, and it seemed like the main target once again was being contrarian to the kind of liberal hawks. You know, whatever they say, we have to say the opposite of. So it wasn't even this kind of tankyism. They're not like neo-Stalinists, but they're more just like reacting to the kind of liberal pro-NATO um, forces. So some things in this new constellation are in fact new, like like that, and then others seem like they're hearkening back to this old Cold War mentality. So. I'm just curious if you see any other trends. You said that you've seen a lot of young people online. Where do you think they're getting this stuff? I think that Max is right, that part of it comes from like the DSA and their frankly quite atrocious internationalist caucus, which is very not internationalist. And I say that as a DSA member, but where do you see, um, I guess, inspirations or outlets that are challenging this like very crude campism on the left. Like we have actually, I've also turned people to, we have Danny Postel has joined us here today. And he's been a writer for many, many years who's also been critical of this kind of the crudities of campism on the left. So I'd say definitely check out his work. But I'm curious um, where you look for inspiration beyond what New Bloom is doing. And yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think it's a very interesting uh, issue. I think that, uh, you know, I think we'll have an article I referred to this tankism today as just warmed over thought. I mean, just this, these tropes are just back out there in some way. Uh, sometimes there are, as I mentioned, I think before, there are some organizational links with the contemporary tankies and older groups. The PSL has been around a while. Uh, Tiao Collective, for example, has strong organizational links to the PSL. In the beginning, I was not sure if they were a front for the PSL. You would have like a webinar they organize. No Tiao member actually appears, and then just a PSL member, uh, some white person comes and does all the talking for a supposedly diaspora organization. And I was like, I was always like, hmm, okay, interesting. Um, so it's sometimes out there that people, you know, these organizations are still out there and politicizing people in a certain way. Uh, some of the actors from, you know, propagating techie thought back in the day are still like this. But I think that is, it is very much still in the ether. Uh, and that is the thing that people are picking up. Uh, because I think a lot of this generation that has become politicized, and that's what I'm quite concerned about, it's occurring through the internet. Uh, and they don't necessarily, uh, I mean, they just might just be kids sitting in front of their computers. I don't think they necessarily have political presence. But then maybe they do go out and join these organizations, such as the DSA or, or what have you, and that ends up having an effect. Um, so I think it's just these general ideas are still out there. And I think that reflects the weakness of the left that we have allowed ourselves to become defined by opposing the right. Uh, the left does not advance ideas. It just says, well, whatever the right does, we're the opposite. And that's very uh, Manichaean. Uh, it doesn't, it, there's no utopian potential to that, uh, just is reacting to what the right is doing. But I think then it, it points to the failure to have compelling narratives or, or frameworks we're learning how to think through inter-imperial inter contentions, an era that is bipolar, a multipolar, and it's not just one world, first world versus second world or third world, um, and, and that kind of tension. I think that that is the thing to think through. And for me then, I think trying to think through that, um, I tried to look for inspiration to local voices on, on other parts of the Asia Pacific that are dealing with the same issue. So with New Bloom, we try to connect with groups. I mean, we're, we're pretty organization closed with Laosan. Uh, for one in Hong Kong, but then with Chinese leftists that are dealing with this in their own countries uh, in terms of their resistance against the state. And I think that that is uh, something that U.S. leftists resisting the U.S. state should try to link up with rather than just being trying to link up the Chinese state, uh, but also leftists in Japan dealing with, uh, for example, U.S. militarism in Okinawa, uh, base construction uh, in South Korea, uh, the Philippines, other parts of the world. Um, but also building these ties can be, I think, easier said than done because there's often not a lot in English and I think that is why the Anglophone left is so important because the English for better or worse due to the history of imperialism throughout the world uh, is the lingua franca and even places like these in the Asia Pacific often are connecting using English and then you just have this all drowned out by a lot of this tanky rhetoric and so I think finding people in this kind of struggle against the tankies is something that I've, I've been trying to do and, and that is uh, part of the the impetus for me going after tankies online I think or fighting with them through polemics is to really build these ties actually yeah.
So there was a clarification question from Lily. Nice to see you, Lily. Um, uh, about Manichaeanism. What do you mean by Manichaean, Manichaean in this context? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess it's kind of binary, you know, good versus evil, uh, you know, just like the left versus right, or you know, all the, you know, just everything versus the U.S. And so the U.S. is seen as the big bad. Anything that opposes it then is seen as right, no matter what that is. And so you have all, a lot of idealization of other state actors that are themselves uh, imperialist or authoritarian or have, uh, you know, just they're not exactly left-wing force in the world. Um, yeah, so that's generally, it's a term for to like kind of binary thought. Yeah. And actually, Brian, since there's no one else on stack, the, the floor is open if folks want to jump in there. But um, my ISC colleague, Brian Tokar, shared a chapter by a colleague of his up above um, on how the right has taken up the discourse of anti-imperialism and decolonization. That's something I've worked on as well. And I'm curious if you've seen that in Asia as well, like conservative forces taking up this mantle. Of course, it has a long history. Um, anti-imperialism is not a necessarily left issue, which should give us at least some pause to, to reflect on that. But have you seen that um, in Taiwan or in China, like kind of really flying the decolonial flag to give a pass? Uh, to domestic policies? Mm, yeah, yeah, I think on a few fronts. Uh, first, I guess I point to that some of the tanky rhetoric is, is quite ethno-nationalist in itself. Uh, so I'm struck by these claims regarding China's borders, or its right to protect its borders, or regulate various quote-unquote ethnic minorities uh, on the basis of like blood and soul nationalism, or even, you know, the, you have a quick reversion to this, these kind of tropes. And then that is interesting to me in this, this kind of right-wing uh, framing, or this right-wing uh, ethno-nationalism that slipped itself through tankyism sometimes. And that particularly comes from Younger people are diaspora uh, sometimes. I think they're just looking for some kind of cultural nationalism to be nostalgic about the heritage of their parents and a left basis um, sometimes. But then, yeah, I think that is actually the case that one does see this rhetoric of regarding specifically uh, more anti-imperialism uh, coming from right-wing forces. In Taiwan, it's the KMT, the former authoritarian party, which still exists and still runs in elections, post-democratization, uh, was backed by the U.S. for decades. Uh, the U.S. backed Chiang Kai-shek and his uh, military dictatorship and that of his son, Chen Chen Kuo, uh, for decades. However, now they are criticizing the U.S. as an unreliable partner, that the U.S. is stringing Taiwan along and selling it weapons, but may not come to its defense, and that uh, the U.S. is, uh, uh, you know, just at the end of the day, it's using Taiwan for its own ends, which is, that is the case. It is the case that the U.S. is uh, propping up Taiwan or backing Taiwan just to stick to China. And Taiwan is unfortunately just caught navigating the both of those. And so then when you have that critique coming from the KMT, that makes it harder for you on the left to be critical of US imperialism because you'll get accused of being pro-KMT or just having the same rhetoric as them or, or what have you. And so then I think this is also the case in China in which uh, you have the rhetoric of anti-imperialism or anti-colonialism being used to fuel cultural nationalism. Just saying that, well, we'll get rid of all these Western influences and embrace our great tradition, the great Han tradition of, of whatever, you know, have different versions of that floating around, Confucianism or uh, other ideologies or some, you know, various dynasties get idealized uh, and that, that is concerning then, because I think then one, uh, I think anti-imperialism or decolonization is not necessarily on a left basis. And so oftentimes the Western left is hearing this rhetoric from uh, the Chinese nationalists that are saying this in China, and they'll think it's the same thing as what you're saying on the left in, in a Western context. Well, you know, decolonization, anti-imperialism, whatever, but it's actually trying to feel this, uh, this uh, nationalist project and often trying to just put for Chinese imperialism to replace Western imperialism. And I think it's also very interesting too, because uh, and particularly for me, my background was studying the history of the 20th century. You saw this rhetoric going back like decades uh, from Japan, the Japanese empire. That's also how they justified the rise of the Japanese empire. And so that has left all this influence, uh, you know, 70 years later, 80 years later, uh, that is still present. Uh, China is still very antagonistic for Japan because of the crimes committed during the Sino Japanese War. But then it itself is rising up and uh, taking on this claim then that, well, we're resisting Western imperialism and that justifies the expansion of our power. This is part of this mission, this historical mission. And we've all seen this before and that's how it ended up the first time, but somehow this is actually still being brought up. And so I think it's interesting because particularly when there's a, a new Cold War framing going on, sometimes I see shades of this framing kind of occurring uh, in, in Asia, yeah, from more the kind of early, earlier 20th century. So Brian, we had a great question up above from Jonathan. Jonathan, do you want to jump on and ask that or?
Okay, so it's in the chat. Um, I'll just read it. Given that people in places like Ukraine or Syria seek help from Western powers against their local oppressor, how do we stand in solidarity with them uh, without reinforcing Western imperialism? How do we work towards a world without empires? Thanks, John. Yeah, it's a tough question. I think um, it is one of those things. I think then particularly, uh, you know, some of their limited perspectives, not really realizing what the U.S. does in other parts of the world. And so sometimes there is a process of education involved. Um, but then I think standing in solidarity in a way that shows that you're not the enemy, um, while also trying to point to maybe some of the limited, some of that this doesn't actually touch on these, these perspectives regarding the U.S., for example. Um, that's very challenging to do, though, and it's very hard to do without coming off as just condescending and just uh, from without... It's interesting too, because I think uh, solidarity is an interesting notion to think about. Solidarity, it provides moral support. It's not for material support, but then it really does affect the uh, alignments of various forces around the world between the left, between various lefts or with the right and various rights. Uh, and so I think that that is, that is really what the role of solidarity statements and things like that show. It's a way to build ties. And so I think I would think of along those lines maybe, um, you know, yeah. I mean, I think that's really a central question. It's one that we've also confronted quite squarely with at the Institute because of our ties to the Kurdish movement in Rojava, which ended up fighting, oddly enough, cheek by jowl with U.S. special forces against ISIS. Um, I mean, a very obviously like confusing um, multi-imperial um, conflict there in Syria. Um, and, I, and I really do, I mean, I'd like to post this to you, but also to our participants of how we balance on the one hand, the need to engage in the world as it is, and on the same time, hold on to our principles and point beyond it. And I just wanted to share briefly, I, I dug up this quote from um, our co-founder, Murray Bookchin. Um, I, I think it's pretty apropos regarding the role of nationalism, imperialism, and warning against simplistic campism. So I think this is the early 90s, he wrote, we also live in a world in which issues sometimes arise on which, a left, on which leftists cannot take any position at all. Issues in which to take a position is to operate within the alternatives advanced by a basically irrational society and to choose the lesser of several irrationalities or evils over other irrationalities or evils. It is not a sign of political ineffectuality to reject such a choice altogether and declare that to oppose one evil with a lesser one must eventually lead to the support of the worst evil that emerges. I also hear echoes here of Adorno's kind of critique of activism and defense of theory at, at certain times, the place where we can get beyond the traps of the real. But on the other hand, this is the world that we inhabit. So when we have, you know, Kurdish or Ukrainian or whoever, you know, Democrats or whatever their politics are asking for, okay, that's all good and well and good, but we need weapons. How should we, how do you think we should position ourselves? And I'm curious what others think as well. Yeah, I think it's a challenge too, because I also don't have a good answer there. As uh, the Bookchin quote points out, this is not exactly a new phenomenon. And so it's kind of disappointing that after all these decades or even, let's say, yeah, decades, hundreds of years, we haven't really arrived at this, this issue uh, and a kind of concrete answer to that. But I think that a lot of times, I think the stakes are very different. Uh, there's an article I was reading that was quite interesting in pointing this out, the stakes for if you're of the left in a place that's a conflict zone, um, versus if you're in the U.S. and you're actually quite removed from this conflict are completely different. And so your life and death is really at stake. And so that I think oftentimes a leftist in, in the Anglophone world or the U.S. Or, or wherever are putting moral high ground claims or, or trying to preserve their own morality, while, whereas the people in these contexts are dealing with a very messy situation, navigating a bunch of actors that claim to have the best interests of your, of your best interests in mind, but really do not they have their own agendas. And uh, uh, just then you are actually forced to make these messy choices and, and align yourself with the, the, uh, these kind of uh, actors that are not exactly more they appear. And so I think that that is a question. It's, it's very hard not to uh, just uh, try to, to preserve your own kind of idealism and, and not actually have to engage in these messy decisions. Uh, but then also, how do you avoid then just lesser evilism or just campism or just backing one clamp against the other in the name of practicality? And so that's that's very difficult. I mean, I think that, that the, the the issue, particularly with China, is that just it's idealized in such rosy terms as a form of escapism from the left or sorry, the West and uh, just the uh, kind of horrors of capitalism that are experienced there. Trying to have this kind of romantic, nostalgized or uh, whatever utopic vision of China and posing that as a, a, a kind of idea to counteract the West, but then that's just not the reality there, and and that that that's the issue. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, precisely, I think you highlight that what becomes critical in one context or one national context is completely apologetic and propagandistic in another, as you pointed out, when like Western leftists parrot uncritically, you know, Chinese state talking points. And you can see that today happening with, you know, arguments with leftists taking on um, Putin's talking points against Ukraine, and then people bring up the Azov Brigade, and how do you wait? How do you wade through these um, complicated actors where, um, yeah, there's there are um, complications on both sides to be sure, but yet this is the world that we inhabit. And do we retreat to our armchairs and to the the, the remove of of theory and idealism, or do we just you know get into the real politique? And I think Bookchin and his earlier critiques of um, especially the left's embrace of nationalism, he said that, you know, Marx and Engels were at least, they were very strategic in their support for various nationalist movements. It was always about where is it going to get us? And that, you know, 40 years uh, later from the new left to today, we don't even have the nominal socialism of, of the Soviet Union. And in China, it's even, you know, it's still fairly tenuous. So what is it that people feel compelled to defend in the first place? Uh, does anyone else have questions they would like to pose to Brian or comments? Yeah, Julie, I'll, please. I'll just add like one last comment. Um, Cause again, yeah, like I was talking in the beginning kinds of like about, you know, sort of seeing a linkage between, you know, like authoritarian leftists, like to borrow a term that um, from the article that Danny just posted, like, and this just sort of like belief that like violence is the only route to like revolution, you know, and like trying to navigate like liberals on the one hand that are like, you know, nonviolent principles, maybe like living, you know what I mean? And then the reality of like, supporting people like like the Kurds and like Ukrainians like arming themselves you know what I mean in very real conflict sort of like situations and again just like I don't like you know it sometimes it feels like is it that useful to like cling to one theory of transformation and say this is the only way that it's going to happen you know or to sort of like leave room you know like, I don't know. I just, because I didn't feel like that answer. I, I don't know if you, anyone really has an, um, an easy answer, but just trying to navigate, like, you know, the, the accusation that you're being, like, naive if you're talking about nonviolence versus sort of, like, the extremism of, like, not seeing a role for it at all, kind of, and just, like, in, like, maybe transformations can arise in a myriad of, of circumstances as they have in history, like when natural disaster strikes or like, you know, I don't know. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I think that's an interesting uh, point to raise regarding authoritarianism and the authoritarian left, because there's, uh, among the tanky left, you do have people who are just, they just seem to be authoritarians and that's their view of what the left is, that it's the powerful state. And I was also alluding earlier to uh, ethno-nationalism when it slips itself into the left through tankyism. And I think that is, something to be cautious of because not everything that calls itself left-wing is in fact left-wing. It is sometimes really right-wing ideologies dressed up in language or, or rhetoric or discourse of the left. Uh, then the point on violence, I think what's interesting about the tanky left in Western context is oftentimes it's a, it just strikes me as a form of like live action role play or something. It's very much people in first world countries just trying to feel they have some stake in this game or whatever of history uh, through embracing kind of uh, extreme rhetoric uh, regarding violence or regarding states and, and so forth. And I think, uh, you know, just claiming that the CIA is everywhere, it's a way to feel like you have skin in the game. And when you're actually this kind of armchair leftist on the internet, uh, and that, that is something that I, I see from the tanky left. I think that drives some of this uh, kind of hyperbolic rhetoric. But then also when I was pointing to, when I, I mentioned that they sort of just want like a good version of the US or a left-wing version of the US, the horizon possibility for their thinking about the political future are quite limited. Uh, they have not, not actually thought of a utopic or uh, future or things beyond what exists now. They just ha want to have something like the U.S., but, you know, like a, a good bully in the world rather than a bad bully, which is what they see in the U.S., and they, they see China as that. Yeah. Anyone else like to pose a question, or should we give Brian a chance to offer any final thoughts or comments? I mean, what strikes me is just where you ended up there, this loss of the utopian vision is how much we are so trapped in this kind of deadlock 
of nationalist conservatism on the one hand and neoliberalism on the other. We could see that both of those at work in um, both Taiwan and China on the one hand and between Putin and Ukraine and the, and the West on the other. And what is, what is the left third pole? What would an international cosmopolitan post-national vision look like? And why has why the left been so unable to advance that? Why is it that the largest left organizations like DSA continually fall back into these campus? That's, that's maybe a big and challenging question, but I'm curious if you have thoughts um, on why this seems to be such a, a difficult position to articulate, because it was, in fact, the main, I would say one of the dominant positions on the left up until the new left was this kind of robust internationalism that even had like a very strong anti-national, you know, where the workers of the world have no country. And yet now we get stuck in these old, old Westphalian containers that don't really um, get us anywhere. Yeah, absolutely. I think a part of it is the lack of a, uh, you know, organized international left in that way. But I think also then the rise of, in the history of the 20th century, the rise of states that claim to be left wing, the Soviet Union, China, et cetera, also then really made matters more complex. I think the left historically has had difficulties with nationalism. You can go all the way back to Rosa Luxemburg, for example, uh, war credits vote, that, that sort of thing. Um, then also states and the relation to the state. And I think then that what has happened is there's not really thinking beyond the state. I think that really statism has just really taken firm root in the left and is not thinking about the possibility of, of what, a, uh, what, you know, what the withering of the way of the state or what have you would look like. And then some vision of, of uh, just utopia is just thought of only in terms of state in very statist terms. And so that's why I think you have this idealization of, of China uh, or, or just very uh, some of the left wing actors in the city of the US pushing for very moderate reforms in the name of, of leftism because they have not really thought beyond the, the state itself. And so I think then thinking that uh, just, uh, I think just thinking about anti-nationalism is another interesting question because anti-nationalism in let's say the US resisting American nationalism does not mean backing, it should not mean backing Chinese nationalism either. And so that failure to think on internationalist terms on international context or from the standpoint of let's say humanity writ large is, is very difficult. I think then that's why you have this kind of blind spot in, in logic from David Harvey or Richard Wolff, where they will not apply the same logic to China that they would to the West or the US or uh, et cetera. I think just having a, a kind of thinking about this kind of more totalizing framework in, 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 in left wing principles, that that should be what we kind of aspire to do. But that has not happened. And so we have this kind of retreat of a utopic vision or uh, any kind of grand narrative for the left itself. And, and that also lends itself to the rise of tanky thought. Yeah. That, that sounds accurate to me. Uh, Danny mentioned, Danny Pastel mentioned, um, possibly responding to Lily, if you're still able to dive in, Danny. Hey, thanks a lot. I was just about to write thanks to uh, both Brian's and to, to the ISE for this really good discussion. But I was, <clears throat> I was just gonna say in response to Lily's comment that um, my own sense is that these, um, whether we want to call it tankyism or campism, I mean, I think those are two slightly distinct uh, phenomena that are related and overlap. But the pro the general problem of, of authoritarianism on the left, um, I think this actually, this phenomenon um, cuts across pacifist versus the, 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 the divide between pacifists and advocates for violence. I mean, you might think that people who romanticize and glorify violence are more given to, to supporting authoritarian regimes um, and that pacifists would be more likely to be anti-authoritarian. But one of the most perverse things that you find is that actually some people who, who explicitly identify with the pacifist tradition are some of the worst tankies. Um, the, uh, in the case of Syria, you have all of the, I mean, H Helena Coban, C-O-B-A-N. I don't know how many people have had the misfortune of, of coming across her work over the years, but she's she runs this, I mean, she's very deeply um, committed to the cause of Palestine. She has, uh, she, she started Just World Books, which does all sorts of, you know, they publish books about Palestine and what and they're doing webinars now. On, so on Palestine, she has huge credibility and she comes out of the Quaker tradition. So she has some sort of uh, deep connection to pacifism. But on Syria, she was an outright apologist for the Assad regime. 
I mean, one of the worst propagandists for the Assad regime, David McReynolds, who was a legendary figure on the American left, ran for president um, as a socialist several times and was a pacifist associated with the um, War Resisters League and, and various anti-war causes for decades, recently died. He was an abs I mean, he was, he was an anti-Stalinist. He was a pacifist and a socialist. But he, was a, but he was an apologist for the Assad regime and for basically any, um, almost any regime in the world that the U.S. was against. So, so people, people who call themselves pacifists um, or, or, or who have, you know, some sort of, um, you know, deep grounding in anti-war. I mean, Medea Benjamin, who, who, who heads up uh, Code Pink. Code Pink is horrible on China. Um, I'm sure Brian could probably talk about that in more detail than I can, and that is not unrelated to Vijay Prashad's position on China, because the same funder is funding both the Tricontinental Institute, the People's Forum, and Code Pink now. Um, there was a very interesting investigative piece about that at New Lines, t connecting the dots and tracing the money. Um, and, 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 you know, I'm not, I'm not saying that Code Pink hasn't done some good work, but there's some really creepy shit going on with them. So I, I and, and on the other hand, there are people who believe in violence um, whose politics are excellent, who are anti-campists and internationalists, um, you know, from, from below. So, so I think that that's the, the, the issue of violence versus nonviolence is not really so salient in all of these debates. It's something else is at work. Um, but yeah, I just, that was just my response to, to your point, Lily. And um, I really appreciated this discussion and I love what New Bloom is doing. So thanks to, to you, Brian, and to, to the ISE for hosting this discussion today. Wait, Danny, would you mind if I responded to your response? Because that Not was, at all. Yeah, Not at all. That, that was super helpful. Yeah, and it might've gotten missed, but I called like some of the non-pacifists like liberals in sort of a pejorative way too, because some of the most ardent capitalists I know are also these sort of peace people. And I'm like, well, are you anti-capitalist then? You know, <laughs> how do those two things coexist? So I appreciate you. Um, complicating that divide as not sort of falling into any neat categories, you know, between tanky or not tanky, but sort of like my more art overarching question, you know, was like, as a leftist, you know, like trying to keep a utopian vision alive, you know, like how, you know, like Marx was very much like the revolution will happen like this, you know what I mean? And I see some of that from, some of my friends, you know, I, you might not have been on already, but I talked about a really close friend becoming very involved in the party for socialism and liberation. And like, um, they're very much like, the revolution will happen like this and it's through violence. And of course, it's not, it's not everyone as you just, you know, mentioned, like not all tankies are like that. And you know what I mean? Like, you know, yeah. Like, but just how important do you think it is to sort of have that theory of transformation up front you know and like argue about it sort of like versus maybe a more like holistic stance that like transformations can happen you know arise spontaneously or sort of take a more nuanced view as they start to occur like like if Syria needs needs uh, Kurds in Syria need weapons for instance it's something I guess that's the bigger thing I'm sort of grappling with is like do we need to be committed you know like is it naive to sort of I don't know. Sorry, that that's my counter, the overarching question I'm sort of asking myself. I think those are great questions. Is it okay if I just briefly respond to that, Brian? Um, these are big questions, Lily, and I, I just appreciate the spirit of where you're coming from with that. I all I was going to type into the chat. God help your friend. For it's the PSL is is really one of the most delusional. I mean, it's basically a cult that has very bad ideas, but it's also a really, a, a, it's a, a cesspool of real ideological pathologies. Um, it's not, and this really, I, this is the note that I would end on. I mean, I live in a world of ideas and debates, and that's why I just plugged like seven different articles in the chat. I'm constantly trying to think through these ideas and, and develop them and formulate arguments myself. But at the end of the day, I have come, maybe not to a final conclusion, but I've, I've, I'm strongly leaning towards the view that, and I think we have to distinguish between like super young people who are just getting active and are ex 
just starting to engage a lot of these debates and arguments on the one hand, who they haven't committed yet. But then people who are like the leadership of PSL, the leadership of 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 the International Committee of DSA, frankly, the the people who are 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 deeply committed to authoritarian uh, leftism, campism, tanky views. They're not going to be they're not going to be budged by any arguments or any ideas. And I'm increasingly of the view that these folks gravitate to these authoritarian political positions for emotional reasons and that it has virtually nothing to do with arguments. Now, I'm not saying arguments don't matter. I've, I've committed most of my life to, to, you know, debates and ideas, but I do, I feel like they matter if you're not yet all the way in for people who are not yet completely gone. And, and no, you know, it's never completely hopeless. There are famous cases of people who were in horrible organizations for years and decades and then, you know, got out, but it's rare, quite honestly. I personally do not for example, I'm I'm gonna I'm I'm in the process of leaving DSA myself. I've spent the last five years or so in DSA on the international committee, and it has become so bad. The the tanky campus authoritarian politics within DSA's international committee have gotten so toxic that I just don't I I don't even want to be in Zoom meetings with those people. I mean, it's really pathological, and it makes me physically ill to occupy the same space with them. So, I mean, I, a, a lot of this comes down to an existential kind of experience. And I, you know, I think that we have to, there are, there are certain people we're just not going to reach anymore. We have to, to, we have to fight them. And so I really appreciate that like, you know, magazines like New Bloom and the Institute for Social Ecology and, and activists like you are, are engaged in this stuff. And I, just a plug for internationalism from below um, for anybody who's interested, you should follow us and, you know, uh, message me if you want to get involved. Thanks, Danny. Uh, Brian, any final thoughts or words you'd like to share before we sign off? Yeah, absolutely. So I think uh, as we found out that through this discussion, uh, there's this phenomenon of tankies and capism, and it's not exactly new, but we are dealing with it again in these conditions today. And so I think it is important to kind of Work on these issues. I mean, for example, I think I, I've written quite a lot on on just fighting tankies, really, through these polemics. Uh, and oftentimes, I don't actually think I'm going to convince a lot of these people are really that are the targets of these 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 polemics because they are really deeply rooted in this. They've certainly devoted years of their lives to these viewpoints. Uh, however, I think I'm staging these arguments for the sake of those who are not so deeply embedded or have not been lost to us in that sense. And I think that that's just the thing that sometimes it actually I find it quite repetitive. Uh, even my own article, I'm just like, well, I'm making this argument yet again. But then I think the point is to stage it publicly in a way, just because there are some people that, that have not really invested years of their lives into this kind of politics that doesn't lead anywhere, actually. Um, and so I think that's the question then. What, how do we deal with this? How do we think out uh, our ways between just uh, an, an, a multipolar world in which there are not good answers? And I think just thinking out, reflecting on these uh, questions is something that's very, very important. I think also paying attention to local voices, people are there. Uh, and uh, uh, trying to have that, that, that in sense of internationalism, which takes the perspective of not just your own domestic context, because what you think is, you know, anti-nationalist in this context could be benefiting another form of nationalism elsewhere in the world. Uh, and so what does it mean then to have a global left and to think of uh, just to rebuild that sense of internationalism, which doesn't operate on the perspective of from nation states, which thinks about the global struggle rather than just what is occurring in this context. And I think that, so in that sense, I think discussions like this are very important and I'm glad to be here today. So I had a good time chatting with everybody. Thank you so much, Brian, for taking time out to talk to us today. I wanna to encourage everyone, well, thank everyone for coming today. Um, I wanna to encourage you to check out New Bloom Magazine. It's great. Um, I wanna encourage folks to stay connected to the Institute for Social Ecology. I put our like newsletter link in there. We've got an upcoming class with Brian Tokar who asked a question and Grace Krishuni on food and climate justice. We're gonna have an event in two or three weeks with Alex Gendler, who's another dissident left voice about Ukraine, who's doing the same Lord's work of fighting with tankies on the left um, in that particular contact uh, conflict. And uh, yeah, I also just wanted to end, I guess, with a, with a little reminder about the kind of positive social vision that we're, that we're uh, still going for, and that at least social ecology is trying to articulate. So uh, going back to that earlier um, quote, critiquing campism from Bookchin, I just wanted to read the second part of it. And he's, he writes, 
we cannot we can say with certainty that any movement that aspires to something less than the anarchist and libertarian socialist notions of the brotherhood of humanity certainly is expressed in the international is less than human indeed from the perspective of the end of the 20th century we're obliged to ask for even more than what the 19th century internationalism demanded we're obliged to formulate an ethics of complementarity in which cultural differentia mutualistically serve to enhance human unity itself in short, that constitute a new mosaic of vigorous cultures that enrich the human condition and that foster its advance rather than fragment and decompose into new nationalities and increasing number of nation states. I thought that might just be a little nice reminder of what the left can be um, offering a much more ethical, socialist and humane vision. So thanks again, Brian, so much for joining us today and to everyone else. Uh, this will be going up on our YouTube channel uh, very soon. So if you know friends that you're like, you should see this or your PSL buddies, you can uh, send it their way. <laughs> thanks, everybody.